All right, let's get started. Again, uh, just to introduce myself quickly, I'm Terry Clark. I'm the chair of the San Falasco section of the Florida chapter of APA. We're located in Gainesville and Ocala region. And this is, I'm happy to announce, this is our first section webinar. And we're very pleased to have Dr. David Barth. I'll introduce him in just a second to talk to us. And his subject today is a new approach to parks and recreation system planning for resiliency and sustainability. A um, couple of housekeeping items I want to just get across to you early on. We will be accepting questions. We estimate Dave's presentation will be 45 minutes to an hour, and then we're leaving at least a half an hour for a few questions and answers at the end of this. So if you can go to the right, there's a little control panel that comes off the software, the uh, GoToWebinar software, and if you go to the right, you'll see a little section called questions. We'd like for you to um, put your questions there and not in the um, other sections for the polling or anything. That'll come up later. So please put any questions you have during Dave's presentation in that section, and we'll follow up with them later on after his presentation. Another item I wanted to point out is if you look down below under handouts, you'll see Dave has posted his full handout presentation that he's going to go through with us today. That's available in a PDF file. You can download that um, and um, go. you can follow that during the presentation or go to it afterwards. Um, let's see. I think that's it of the housekeeping items. And now I get to introduce Dave. Uh, Dave is a registered landscape architect. He's a certified planner and certified parks and recreation professional. And his specialty is planning, design, and implementation of the public realm. Uh, he's developed parks and recreation system plans for over 80 communities through the United States, including Washington, D.C., Miami-Dade County, Norfolk, Virginia, downtown San Diego, and the city of Raleigh. He also has covered, I don't know how many communities in Florida, but if any of you are in the parks and recreation systems planning profession, I'm sure you've run across Dave either at conferences or he's done work for your community. He's very well known in Florida. He's uh, also, also co-authored an APA publication called From Recreation to Recreation, as well as a contributor to APA's Planning and Urban Design Standards for Parks and Recreation Needs Assessments. And most recently, he authored APA's Planning Advisory Service memo called Alternatives for Determining Parks and Recreation Levels of Service. He has an undergraduate degree from University of Florida here in Gainesville. He has a master's degree in organizational leadership from Palm Beach Atlantic in West Palm Beach. And he has a PhD also from the University of Florida here in Gainesville. Um, he is currently president of his own firm, Barth and Associates. He's had his company since 2012. And prior to that, some of you may have interacted with Dave when he was with Gliding Jackson. Uh, Dave was also a principal with that firm and ran the West Palm Beach office. Now, he also is um, the author of a book that's going to be coming out in the fall. You can pre-order it at Amazon. I'm giving, here, giving him a little plug here. It's Parks and Recreation System Planning, A New Approach for Creating Sustainable, Resilient Communities. That'll be available in July. And I'm also just two personal notes on Dave. I won't, I won't embarrass you, Dave. But prior or while he was beginning his career in planning, Dave, this is a fun fact, was he started and ran a canoe outfitting company in Central Florida, and got to know all of uh, the great canoeing uh, areas in Florida, and was very successful with that. And he recently completed canoeing and camping the entire length of the Swanee River. So I'm impressed. Dave, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. And Terry was one of my companions on that trip. So thank you. So thanks everybody for for spending time with us. Um, I we, um, uh, hope you can make this worth your while. Uh, I'm going to switch off to the PowerPoint. Let's see if I do that. And Terry, you can let me know if you don't see my full screen. Are we good? We're good. So I've been doing parks and recreation system planning uh, for over 30 years, um, and first through the firm Gliding Jackson, which became a com and then on my own for Barth Associates. And I started system planning about the time that 
sustainability started becoming popularized. And I'll talk about that more in detail. And so uh, my approach to system planning has always been based on the idea of how do we do parks and open spaces in such a way that we are influencing the quality of life in the community. And whether you use the term livability or sustainability or more recently resiliency, they're all pointing to the same thing, the idea of using parks in the public realm as a tool uh, for more livable, sustainable, and resilient communities. So, I have my first glitch, the arrow key's not working. So there you go. So recently I wrote this book and this is my only shameless plug of the book. Um, and thank you, Terry, for bringing that up. Um, but you can reserve a copy on Amazon if you wish. But there's two big ideas that have come out of, of my practice over the past 30 years. Um, one is that I think we're past the tipping point in the United States where there's even a question about this. Um, it's pr been pretty well proven that parks and recreation systems can generate a slew of sustainability and resiliency benefits. But the caveat is that the systems have got to be thoughtfully planned, designed, and managed uh, to generate those benefits. And then the second big idea was kind of an aha that I got while I was writing the book. Was the book started as sort of a treatise about the relationship between parks and open space and resiliency and sustainability. But then I realized that part of the issue we have to address as planners is that the planning process that we've been using for park system planning is well over 100 years old. Um, and that we're in this new era where we're talking about sustainability and resiliency. And so we need a, a planning process that's equal to the, uh, the task of, of trying to create more livable communities. So those are kind of the big themes that I'm going to talk about in this presentation, too. So I want to start with this framework for sustainability and resiliency. And in one sense, these are sort of the influences of my practice as much as a framework. So we start with, you know, right around the time when I started doing park system planning, we had the Brundtland Commission and we had the World Commission on Environment and Development, um, where we came out with this definition of sustainable communities. And just so I would remember, I put that down at the bottom. You know, sustainable communities or sustainable development was defined as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations. And for those of you who are as old as I am, we really struggled for a long time about metrics for sustainability. And when I went back for my doctoral work in 2012, I spent a lot of time trying to research the different sustainability metrics and how they can relate to parks and recreation level of service metrics, and I'll talk about that in more detail. But during my research, I found this chart over on the right, which was as recent as 2012, that I thought did a pretty good job of saying you can define sustainability through these four areas. And, and traditionally, we talked about the three pillars or the three legs of sustainability, but they've added the fourth. So they talk about inclusive social development, environmental sustainability, inclusive economic development, and then peace and security. And you can see the bullets under those. So we have a, you know, we have kind of one piece of the framework, one influence on my work has been this definition of what we mean by sustainable communities. I'm not quite sure of the timing of livability, but I think we started talking about livability around the same time we started talking about new urbanism and smart growth, and that would have been the 80s and 90s. Now, I don't know if you can see the details on this chart, but it points to many of the same things that sustainability talks about. So it talks about having healthy communities, having safe places to live, having housing choices, um, uh, multimodal transportation networks, um, social sustainability. So a lot of the same words that are used when we talk about sustainability are also used when we talk about livability. And I think it's really interesting that um, for those of you who are boomers like me, you know, the folks who have embraced livability uh, are folks like the AARP and the State Elder Affairs um, Division. So, you know, there's a lot of folks who really have bought into this idea of the elements of, of uh, livability. So that's kind of the second big influence uh, for this work. And then most recently, we have resiliency. And I think of resiliency has gained steam over the last five or 10 years. I think it's much more accessible than sustainability. It's easier to get your arms around. 
And I really like the definitions from the Rockefeller Foundation, which talks about that you can define resiliency both in terms of shocks. So you can see the list on the left and the chart of the 2019 billion dollar disasters. You know, those are shocks to communities. And then you have the chronic stresses. So I think if you pull all those together, you know, if you take the definitions of resiliency, of livability, of sustainability, we have plenty of indicators that tell us what we're aiming for, what we're trying to achieve. Now, there's a fourth influence for me particularly. Around the same time that sustainability was coming into vogue, Galen Kranz, who is an architectural historian out of Berkeley, wrote this book called The Politics of Park Design. And this was in 1990. And what she realized was that in the United States, we've gone through these eras of park design. Each one's lasted somewhere between 30, 40, 50 years. And then each era has reflected the values of the community. So she documented going back to the mid 1800s, we had the pleasure ground and that's the photo on the lower left. This idea of this, of parks and recreation were a place of leisure, primarily for the upper class. And then we got into the reform park movement where we were trying to get people to correct their behaviors. Like we had public bathhouses teaching people to bathe, trying to get men out of bars and saloons and trying to uh, get them to be responsible uh, members of society. And then she goes through these other systems as well. The recreation facility era, for example, was kind of the image on the right where every community got swing sets and playgrounds and then to this uh, era of the open space system. And then around 1990, she published an article and she says, you know what, right about when I wrote this book, we've come into a new era and that we've come into the era of the sustainable park. And this era is all about making cities more ecologically and socially balanced and sustainable through parks and recreation. And those parks should also play a role in solving larger urban problems outside of the park boundaries integrated with the urban fabric. And that, to me, was a major influence. Um, that's kind of the fourth part of this framework for sustainability and livability. So my entire approach to parks and recreation system planning comes from this idea of not only Kranz as sustainable park, but the definitions of resiliency, sustainable, sustainability, and livability. Uh, that we just reviewed. So moving forward, there's kind of three big concepts um, that color my approach that I want to talk about. So the first one is, if we're going to talk about parks and open space planning, um, we need to be doing it, I'm sorry, especially if we're talking about parks and open space planning to create more livable, resilient, sustainable communities. We must be doing it within the context of the public realm. And not just the public realm as a collection of facilities, but the public realm as a plexus, which is a term that we don't use very much in planning, but I, I, I think it's appropriate. Plexus being this interconnected system. So this diagram that we developed, uh, Carlos Perez at Gliding's Action developed this probably 10 or 15 years ago. This diagram shows that whether you live in a multifamily uh, building or in single family development, that you meet many of your daily needs through this interconnected public realm network. And we drew it sort of like a subway map. So you can see that all the interconnectivity uh, on the lower, on the middle left is made up of streets, bike lanes and sidewalks, greenways and trails, transit, blueways and utility corridors. And they are connecting people from their homes to parks that they can walk to, which we think of as neighborhood or local parks to larger parks, to schools, to civic facilities, to archaeological sites, to beaches, water access, um, cultural facilities, etc. So this idea, the, the, the first concept for this approach says that we are designing our parks and recreation system as part of this interconnected system of uh, the public realm. An example of this, I've, I've always loved this chart. This was a figure ground model that we created for Norfolk years ago. And everything in black is the public realm. And what's interesting, if you do this for any of your communities, um, you'll find that the public realm comprises at least 35 percent of your communities. In the case of Norfolk, as much as 50 percent of the communities. So the, the first big idea is 
if we're trying to make more resilient, sustainable, livable communities, and we control 50% of the land mass, what an opportunity we have to make our communities uh, more resilient, sustainable, livable, et cetera. The other idea here was uh, there's a gentleman named John Crompton, who's a professor emeritus at uh, Texas A&M. And he came out in the late 90s, early 2000s, talking about here's the kinds of benefits that we can generate from parks in the public realm. And so you can see he organized those under the three legs of sustainability. But his point was that if we can harness the power of what you see on the left, then we have the opportunity to generate all these kinds of benefits for the community. So that, to me, is a very compelling concept for this new approach. In my practice, uh, there's a couple of plans that are really oldie goldies that I, I, I really like. One was we did the plan for Pinellas County back in the early 2000s. And I don't think you can read the text on the chart on the left. But the, what the text talks about is that the Pinellas uh, County Planning Department and the Board of County Commissioners created a preamble for their comp plan that they called Planning to Stay. And their whole goal was to make Pinellas County the kind of place that instead of just attracting retirees, would be the kind of place that families and residents would want to stay, start businesses, raise their families, et cetera. And so we did a parks and open space system plan. So you can see it's called a recreation, open space, and culture system master plan that tried to build on the planning to stay, stay idea. And the chart on the left talks about all the elements of the public realm that contribute to trying to create the kind of place where people would want to stay and raise your family and start businesses. The other oldie goldie that I've always loved was we did the plan for Miami-Dade County, again, back in the early 2000s. And it was the same idea. We, we coined the phrase through the park's window that we would try to create this 50-year vision for a sustainable Miami-Dade County that would change the development culture for Miami-Dade. So it was a very ambitious goal through great parks, public spaces, natural and cultural places, streets, greenways, trails, and water trails. And you can see the principles that we have of a livable, sustainable Miami-Dade County on the left. So we very much were trying to illustrate this idea of the, the integrated public realm or plexus that would generate these benefits for the community. More recently, when I was doing research for the book, I was looking at other models around the country and I really liked this uh, urban design framework that was done for Portland, Oregon, because you can clearly see the different elements of the community. And you can look at the legend on the bottom. And they talk about in the urban design framework, the role of the urban centers, the role of their streets and corridors, both at you know, the large corridors as well as their neighborhood corridors. They have high, they have high capacity, I'm getting tongue tied, high capacity transit and rail. They talk about greenways and trails. They talk about urban habitat, water bodies, and then um, just different pattern areas. So I thought this is a very compelling, simple diagram that really shows this whole idea of the interconnected public realm, which includes parks, but with the aim of actually being a design framework for a livable urban area. So those are kind of the, the, the three big concepts. Um, or I'm sorry, that's the two concepts that are the uh, that have informed this work. But we had a question for you, and so we have a poll that's open, um, and we want to know: Does your agency participate in this idea of integrated, long-range public ground planning, where you're doing simultaneous stormwater transportation land use planning together? If you'll take a couple of seconds and uh, do the poll, and we'll see what the findings are. And Patty, tell me if you need me to close my screen. Sorry, no. <laughs> okay. So do we have the poll results up yet? Yes, it's 31%, no, not very often, 54% sometimes, and 15% yes, consistently. Oh, cool. I would love to hear from the 15% the, uh, 
uh, about some of the things that you're doing, because one of the thoughts I had when I was doing this was the idea that perhaps we as planners should consistently, so for example, when we do our, our ears, um, that we should consistently, uh, when we're updating our comp plans, also update our transportation, storm order, parks, master plans, land use plans. And I'm always looking for examples of folks who are doing that. So if anybody feels like emailing me or sharing examples, that would be great. So, okay, I'll keep going. So the, the second kind of big concept for this approach is looking at parks and recreation systems, not only as an integrated public realm, but also understanding that we have multiple dimensions through which we can view parks and open space plans. So um, I had an old client who told me the only thing he ever used to ask when he approached the community was what color swing sets you want, red or blue. And parks and recreation has gotten so complex since then. Um, uh, if any of you have read Peter Harnick's work, he says people say uh, parks and recreation are not rocket science. And he says, no, it's actually far more complex than rocket science. But when we're talking about parks and recreation system planning, this is a list of the potential dimensions that one could use when they're doing system planning. And so it ranges from everything from social equity to economic development to opioid abuse. Um, and this chart on the left talks about parks and recreation system planning for stormwater, uh, for stormwater treatment and management. So the second big idea, in addition to parks as part of the overall public realm and uh, connected plexus, is think about the multiple dimensions that we can approach uh, uh, parks and recreation systems through. The third big concept that kind of colors uh, this work is this idea that every public space should be a high performance public space. The term high performance public space came from my research in my dissertation. I was researching the factors that lead to the adoption of innovation in the public realm planning and design process. And we had to come up with the word that would describe a park that generated multiple benefits. And so we used the term high performance public space and it was the basis for me selecting case studies. And we said a high performance public space can be any type of public realm space. It can be a plaza, it can be a street, it can be a trail, it can be a park. So um, one of the high performance public spaces that I think is really demonstrates the idea is the city of Kissimmee Lakefront Park that I was involved in. And I was very fortunate to be involved in um, uh, about five or 10 years ago. Um, and the city of Kissimmee tracked some of their metrics. So you can go down this list and they really did hit triple bottom line, major increases economically. Uh, the park functions as this incredible social gathering space for the entire community. Uh, there's no cost to participate. You know, it's free, it's open to everyone. Um, if you happen to visit it at 10 o'clock at night, it's as busy as it is during the day. People are out there having dinner, big families are gathering, they're kicking out these beautiful pavilions. The special venues are booked 40 weeks in advance or more. Uh, and there's been all kinds of economic investment, both in downtown, which is in the lower photo, downtown is to the right. So the park connects the lakefront through the street network and trails to the downtown to the right. So it's totally reinvigorated um, downtown Kissimmee. So that's a great example of a high performance public space. So I've talked about these three big concepts, right? The, the parks and recreation as part of the public realm, it's part of an interconnected system. We talked about these multiple dimensions of parks and open space. And we talked about high performance public spaces as kind of the underlying concepts to this new approach. And there's a video that's put out by the City Parks Alliance that I think does a far better job in three minutes um, than I can do if I talk for an hour. So I'd like you to see that video and I'll go ahead and unplug my headset and let you watch it for a couple minutes. Cities are really the economic engines of the country. So what happens is Extraordinarily important to what happens with the country. And I think that importance is growing. More than 80% of the American population.
population lives in urban and metropolitan areas. And as these cities are densifying, they're beginning to look at parks to help address our pressing urban infrastructure challenges. The cities who are going to compete in the 21st century have to have a 21st century version of those spaces. So you build a road, for example, around getting A to B. Or you can build a park that helps with mobility and getting A to B, but also serves the purpose of a stormwater. We're going to compete in the 21st century. We have to have a 21st century version of those spaces. So you build a world, for example, around you get from A to B. Or you can build a park to help with mobility and get from A to B, but also serves the purpose of a stormwater management system. It can serve a purpose of improving the health of the community around it. And it can also serve the purpose of really improving the quality of the community. As, mm-hmm. it has water quality benefits. It's cleaning the it has air quality benefits, cleaning the air. There's job creation benefits. There's long-term job creation benefits. Along the Atlanta Beltline, we have called Fort Ford Stormwater Park. The original plan for that was to build a big underground tank underneath a 16-acre municipal parking lot. That would have cost $40 million, and this green infrastructure cost $24 million. So therefore, there was savings of $16 million. I think more and more we're seeing a holistic approach these systems, and function can actually be beautiful. I believe cities in the future are going to rethink that 40% of that public wealth that was overplanned, overprogrammed for cars, and will start sharing in a very different way. If we can make an area safe for walking, like, and it gives people transportation choices, and it also helps the city achieve some of its equity goals. The park system creates a backyard where many people don't have one and don't have open space, so they allow for communities to gather outside. Study after study has shown that the more open space and the more dedication of park space that you have, the healthier your community will be. We know that increasing physical activity reduces negative health outcomes such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, heart attack rates. The closer you live to green space, the more likely you are to access it and the more likely you are to be active. For every dollar spent on creating and maintaining trails, you save three dollars in healthcare expenses. If you intend to help job creators, you've got to be concerned about the health in your community. I think the whole premise of economic development has shifted now. People want quality of life as a major indicator. Companies are now looking for major indicators in that realm. One of the things that developers understand is that if I have parks, people are more likely to invest in one live in and work in an area. The high line, $150 million worth of investment, created $2 billion in economic activity. Cities are improving the long-term durability and value of their real estate by creating public gathering places and connectivity. It's so clearly defined that properties next to parks, especially well-maintained parks, Go up in we spent about $13 million to build Falls Park. Within a year and a half, we had over $150 million private investment directly adjacent to the park. It exceeded any of our expectations. When we see the cities that have made those long-term investments in urban park and recreation systems, those cities seem to be thriving. They put that basic infrastructure in place. What we can do is replicate that kind of investment in every neighborhood, and you'll see improvements. Not only are they actual improvements, because people feel safer and they want to be there, there's an issue of equity. It makes the neighborhoods feel better about themselves, and therefore willing to do great things and to move out of poverty. Great cities have to think about great public spaces and how those great public spaces you know, serve their citizens. If you expect people to live in a more dense environment, you're going to have to have parks as part of that equation. You can't be a great city without great parks. I have put the link to the video, which is on YouTube, into the chat session if you wish to um, view it later. So I am back. Terry or Patty, let me know if you can hear me. Okay. Yeah, you're good, Dave. Okay, great. So part of what I love about that video is it's not people like me who are you know, a planner, landscape architect, or parks and rec professional, not me getting up and talking about this great relationship. It is mayors, elected officials, developers. It's, it's 
uh, really influential folks in the community talking about the important role of parks and open space in their community in being more resilient, sustainable, livable, etc. By the way, um, I now show that video uh, at the beginning of a lot of our public workshops. I also show it to elected officials. And even though it's very much oriented towards large cities, what I try to explain, especially for, say, rural or suburban communities, is that the principles that they're talking about are still very relevant. It doesn't mean you have to have 30-story high rises for um, the, the concept of the public realm uh, being important to your community for sustainability and resiliency still being valid. Um, so um, I would encourage people to um, actually support the City Parks Alliance uh, and use some of their other materials, but also show that video whenever you get a chance. So if you look at the projects they show in the video, things like the High Line or the historic Fourth Ward Park in Atlanta, we are doing a great job throughout the United States of doing individual projects that help make our communities more resilient, livable, and sustainable. What I realize, though, is we've not adopted that approach necessarily to our system planning. So we, we sort of do one-offs. You know, we'll do one project at a time. But there are very few communities that I know, if any, that I know of, that are taking an entire system-wide approach to making every public space a high-performance public space and one that generates these different kinds of benefits. So um, the second part of this presentation is taking a fresh look at the parks and open space system planning process and talk about how we approach the system as a way to generate community-wide benefits in addition to individual projects. So the traditional system planning process, and I've used this now for you know, up until the last five or 10 years, I was using exactly the same approach, is a very linear process, right? It starts with existing conditions. It's very much a strategic planning process. And then it goes to needs assessments, to long range vision, down to funding and ultimately approval. And I think in a lot of communities, the attitude was once you do that, you're done. You don't need to look at it again for another 10 or 15 years, and then you do it all over again. And the new approach that we've um, proposed, and this is what a good part of the book is about, is not only is it not necessarily linear, it is cyclical the same way other planning documents are, meaning that you complete it, you implement, and you do it again. And that's why earlier I talked about it would be great if we could get all of our long-range system plans on the same cycles so that we're doing um, the comp plan, our transportation plan, our stormwater master plans, our parks master plans, all con um, uh, simultaneously, or at least in the same cycle, uh, where we can share needs assessment processes as well as capital improvement pro uh, projects, et cetera. So one big, big change is, is viewing it not necessarily as a linear process, but a cyclical process. But there's also a lot of interim steps we've added to enrich the process to make it more uh, relatable to sustainability and resiliency than, say, the traditional processes. And I'll talk about that in more detail. The, the improvements to the process, or uh, I'll say the new process, borrows heavily from three major uh, thought areas. One is project management, and Terry's written a book on project management, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I'll give him his shameless plug. Um, this idea of strategic planning, which for a lot of years, I think people have kind of rolled their eyes at the idea of strategic planning. But um, this chart that came from UNESCO talks about how strategic planning is kind of very different than strategic planning, um, very different than traditional planning. Um, and I particularly like the idea is that it's more iterative, it's more result-oriented, and emphasis on implementation. So I borrowed heavily from strategic planning. And then in my research at the University of Florida, um, I learned about uh, science, I learned about applied social research, and so there's that body of knowledge that's really helped enrich this process, particularly in the needs assessment uh, phase of the project. And I'll talk about that in more detail. But those three areas of best practices uh, have helped um, in creating this new approach or this enhanced approach uh, as opposed to the traditional approach. So I'll start from the top. We'll take about 15 minutes or so, and we'll take you around the circle and just talk about kind of key highlights. And then if people have any questions during the Q&A process, we can talk about them in more detail. 
Um, there are some folks uh, who, like me, love process and are real process geeks. And for other folks, it's really, really dry. So again, I'll try to make it fairly quick, and then we'll see where you want to go during the Q&A process. So in Terry's book on project management, he talks about that if you're a project manager for a project like a Parks and Recreation System Master Plan, that you may want to spend as much as 40% of your time on that project in the initiation and planning phase. And that's the first big improvement, I think, to this proposed new approach, is that in order to create more resilient and sustainable communities, in order to be much more thoughtful about the Parks and Recreation System master planning process, we've got to spend more time up front. And so we talk about the project charter and the project plan that Terry talks about in his book, as well as a readiness audit. So here's Terry's book. Um, and I'll just pick one thing. He talks about here's what a project charter might look like. The whole purpose of a project charter is to spend enough time before you begin that everybody knows exactly what you're trying to achieve in your project and that you get the approval of the necessary folks to move forward. And then in his book, he talks then how you move from a project charter to a project plan. If I apply this to parks and recreation planning, I think one of the most important things on his list is in the middle there, it's the project team. So for example, we talked about 60 different dimensions that one could look at in parks and recreation system planning. So the team needs to reflect those dimensions. So let's say that you say in your community that stormwater management is important. So somebody on the team, whether it's a consultant or whether it's a staff member, Somebody on the team needs to be representing the stormwater interests. Similarly, if you say social equity is important or economic development is important or crime prevention or homelessness, whatever those different dimensions, health, for example, whatever those different dimensions are that you want to try to approach through parks and recreation or parks and open space planning needs to be represented by somebody on the team. So, you know, that takes a lot of time. So just getting the team together. It's just one facet of this project charter that's really important in the initial phases of the project. Another idea under this initiation phase is what I'm calling the readiness audit. And I mentioned before that when I was doing my dissertation, I was looking for the factors for the adoption of innovation in the planning design of public spaces. It turns out that the three primary factors, the three things that are most important in the adoption of innovation and then ultimately the adoption of the plan are a strong leader, a collaborative relationship, and this idea of being willing to be open to the community, external characteristics, and having um, a robust stakeholder involvement. So I realized that you could use that up front, in addition to the project charter and the project plan, as really a readiness audit to see if you're ready to even start doing a parks and open space plan that's going to generate sustainability and resiliency benefits. So, for example, if you don't have a strong leader or a champion already in place, and typically that champion is an elected official, if you don't have someone who's going to, who's going to advocate for the outcome of the process from the very beginning, chances are you're not going to be very successful at implementation or adoption. If you don't have a collaborative team in place, you're probably not going to be real successful at adoption or implementation. And if you're not willing to really, really bend over backwards to get meaningful input from the public, you're probably not going to be successful. So I've gotten to the point of saying that if one or more of those primary factors are not in place, you may want to take some time up front to get them in place or postpone the project. Uh, until they are in place. So those are some of the things to think about in the first step in the process. So here's the second question for you. Uh, I thought uh, Terry would be interested in this question as well. Um, do you, is your agency require that you do a project charter or a project plan uh, before you start any new project? And Patty, if you'll let me know when the results are in, I'd be interested as well what the findings are.
There you go. 47, not very often, 40, sometimes 13, yes, consistently. Interesting. So, Terry, during the Q&A, if you want to talk about the bit that a bit and the, um, the purpose of the charter and project plan, I think that'd be interesting. Yeah, I'll be so, happy to do that. And Dave, let me just put a quick plug in for the May 22nd webinar that I'll be doing on project management. So everybody, you can go to the APA website or the APA Florida chapter website and uh, register for that. Thank you. And they get to see cool photos of your motorcycle trip. So, so the second step, um, and you can see it highlighted in four different places, gets back to this idea of frequent communication with your elected officials and, and key staff. So the second step in the process that we, we've kind of enhanced the traditional process with is not only having kickoff meetings with staff, a project steering committee, elected officials, but having at least four times through the process where you're getting feedback from your elected officials and a steering committee and other folks. And there is a marked difference in the success of our plans when we have frequent face time with our elected officials, either through one-on-one -on -one interviews or, or workshops with them or formal meetings or briefings. Um, and at different parts of the process, we use different techniques. But the more time we have with them from the very beginning of the process, uh, the more likely are we uh, uh, to lead to a, an adoptable, implementable plan. The third step goes back to those dimensions again. So traditionally in the parks and open space system planning process, you kind of evaluate demographics and parks and recreation facilities. But if you're really trying to do a plan that addresses different dimensions of the community, whether it's community health or vulnerability, whether it's climate change, whatever that is, it's at this phase of the project that you do a deep dive into those topics. I talk in the book about uh, an old nightline, I don't know if anybody remembers that show, where they actually had a, a, a session called the deep dive and they talked about how the planning process works. But it's this idea of taking any one topic that you're interested in and doing research on it and finding out what the status of that process or that, that topic is in your community. And then bringing that back to the group so you can discuss it and decide how to move forward. Again, whether it's stormwater treatment or whether it's climate change, whatever that dimension is. So the evaluation of existing conditions is a point, for, is, is a point in the process where you get really immersed and whatever issues you want to address through the public ground planning process. So here's the list of dimensions again, for example. And these are just 60 dimensions that I've come up with. There's, there's probably dozens or, or, or hundreds more that you could approach. You know, so the image here, for example, is about uh, heart disease. You know, there's all kinds of research that you could do into demographics whether it's age diversity, cultural, or economic. This is some work that Carlos Perez did in Smyrna, Georgia. You can uh, create your evaluation criteria for your public realm system. And I don't know if you can see all the words on the chart, but that's 20 or five or 30 evaluation criteria that we were using to evaluate the public realm in Smyrna. And if you look closely, you'll see stormwater management on the lower left, you'll see multimodal capacity, um, uh, you'll see energy efficiency. Those are some of the dimensions that Smyrna want to take a look at. And what this chart does, it uses a criteria to evaluate whether different elements of the public realm meet or exceed or are below expectations uh, based on a benchmark. And then you have a map on the right that actually plots the findings. So you can use the existing conditions analysis criteria to evaluate your public realm. You can also involve the community in the evaluation at this point. So on several of our projects, we've actually had an evaluation day where we've invited the public or an advisory committee to come out and help us evaluate different um, uh, areas of the public realm using the criteria that we came up with for the process. So again, that, that existing conditions evaluation phase is a chance for you to do a deep dive into your system no preconceived ideas about what you're going to find out, but you're just evaluating to see kind of what the current status is. A new step that we've added into the process is what I call a preliminary implementation framework, and there may be other terms you can use. 
But the idea is to depart a little bit from the traditional process and borrow a little bit from the uh, historic scientific process. Um, and the idea there is to form a hypothesis early in the process. So the traditional process in the left says that you start with existing conditions and you build over time until eventually you come up with a long range vision and then you cost it out and you come up with a strategy and then you try to get it approved. Sometimes the scientific method says that you come up with a question first and you form a hypothesis. So before you have all kinds of data, you hypothesize, in this case, what the vision might be and how you're going to implement it. And then you experiment and you use the rest of the process to determine what the answer actually is. And so to give you an example, in Nassau County, we are currently doing their Parks and Open Space System Master Plan. And this is Nassau County, Florida, um, just outside of Jacksonville. That map shows Jacksonville on the lower half of the screen, and then the, the Nassau County is on the top. But before we ever did, ever even started the Parks and Open Space System Master Plan, we did a preliminary implementation framework, and we hypothesized what the system might look like. So this map was our hypothesis that we showed to the county commission. And it shows this network of greenways, open spaces, streams, rivers, all the natural systems in the county that we want to preserve. It shows the locations of um, bikeways and trails uh, and major roadway networks. It shows the locations of small local parks. Those blue circles are about a mile wide. And most of those blue circles, we are saying, need to be built by future development. So this plan looks at where future development may occur. And the large red circles are where the county may want to land bank and build large regional parks to serve the needs of the community. Part of this hypothesis was that all the blue circles would be built by changes to the land development regulations and that the large red circles would be funded in part by updating the impact fees in the county. And so... We also developed prototypes of what those local parks might look like that would be developed by the developers. And we said we need to change the prescription in the land development codes from just saying that to set aside on a percentage of land basis to actually saying here's what those parks should look like and feel like and here's what the minimum requirements would be. And we also did a prototype of what one of these large regional parks may look like. And so we defined the roles of developers versus the county. We talked about what potential metrics might look like, level of service metrics for both the local parks and the regional parks, but also conservation areas, indoor recreation space, et cetera. And we said to the commission, here are the kinds of things we need to figure out. Again, all of this was done as a preliminary implementation framework before we ever started the Parks and Open Space System Plan in, in the in full force. In that time, we either met with the commissioners or presented to them um, four times. So we already had an incredible amount of face time uh, with the commission so that none of these things would be a surprise as we got into the planning process itself. And in fact, right now we're finishing up the existing conditions and needs assessment phase of the planning process. We will be back in front of them for a fifth time to talk about what we found out and how we may want to fund the system. So the preliminary implementation framework, I think, is just a really uh, positive addition to the traditional planning process because it allows you to start talking about funding, implementation, et cetera, way early in the process than we have done traditionally. The next phase in the process that's really the heart of the planning process is the needs assessment process. And in here, we've also added some scientific basis to it, uh, as well as some strategic thinking to it. The difference in the in the traditional process than, say, what we're proposing is just being more scientific about data collection, being very, very clear about which sources of data are scientifically or statistically representative. Uh, for example, the only thing or the only technique that's statistically valid in the typical needs assessment process is the mail survey because it's based on a random sampling where all the other techniques that we used um, are valid and they're 
both quantitative and qualitative, but none of them are statistically represented. And so just being more robust about data collection, being transparent about the sources of the different data, and then taking this triangulated approach, which comes from the social sciences, that says we're going to use mixed methods, meaning both we've got quantitative and qualitative data, but then we're going to triangulate it. We're going to compare the findings from the different techniques that we use in the needs assessment process to tell our elected officials what their residents and voters think are the top priority needs. So traditionally, we may have used two or three of these techniques. I think in order to be good scientists, we have to use, say, six or eight or 10 of these techniques and be able to present them in such a way that we're explaining which ones are scientifically, statistically valid, which ones are more anecdotal and qualitative, and reporting what our findings are, and then getting feedback from our elected officials about the findings. Now, that's not to say that the qualitative techniques um, have to be boring. So the idea is that our public involvement phases still need to be interactive and fun and robust. But the idea, again, as scientists, is that reporting the findings in a more uh, robust way. And then this idea of triangulation, this is a lot to unpack on this chart, but all it shows is at the top of the chart is we have the different techniques. On the left of the chart, we have the different findings. And so these dots indicate every place where the needs assessment technique indicated that that priority was a top priority. So we did it for amenities did it for programs, did it for barriers to usage, and also did it for community-wide challenges. So for example, in this particular community, uh, which comes from the city of Sarasota, if you go to the chart on the right and you look at the number of dots, uh, what we found out is that the residents think that traffic congestion, homelessness, and community safety were the three top challenges that we need to address through the Parks and Open Space System Master Plan. And then on the top left, you can see which of the amenities got the most dots. So things like um, restrooms, uh, walking and hiking trails, neighborhood parks, uh, uh, site furnishings, park shelters, those are some of the most important amenities that residents want to see at parks as well. So level of service has been a, a real conundrum for a lot of planners uh, when it gets to parks and recreation. The last set of standards that, in essence, I'm hoping this book will replace were standards that were published in 1996 by the National Recreation and Parks Association. And even those standards indicate, um, Patty or Terry, I don't know if you've got your um, mute off, but I don't know if other people can hear the, the sound. Um, but they state in 1996 that even their standards um, that every community must come up with its own level of service standards. So what I hear from the National Recreation and Parks Association is they get calls all the time. People say, what standards should I use for parks and recreation um, planning? And the reality is there are no standards. It's not like the Green Book for Transportation or other standards, uh, especially um, since we no longer are required to have level of service standards in our comp plans in Florida. Um, you are free to create whatever level of service standards you wish to create that are appropriate for your community. So this chart shows that typically in Parks and Rec, we have these nine standards on the left or nine metrics. And you can look at the bullets and see what the different metrics are. And the graphic on the right comes from the city of Denver showing access level of service, which is the fourth one on the left showing where there are places in the city of Denver where people don't have access to a, to a park within a walkable distance. So they talk about the 10 minute walk, which is a, a national trend right now. So those hatched areas are voids in the Denver fabric where people cannot reach a park within 10 minute walk. So those are some of the typical level of service metrics but what's absolutely important is that you or we as planners determine what's most important to our community, and we fashion a set of level of service metrics that fit our communities. This slide is kind of the latest example of the conundrum we have in a lot of our Florida communities. And I was talking to the city of Hollywood Parks Director this morning because we're doing Hollywood's park system plan. The yellow highlighted chart on the top 
comes directly, it's a screenshot from the um, city's comp plan. And I believe this was probably done when we had concurrency requirements and when a recreation open space element was mandated, but I don't know that for sure. But what it shows is the city has 380 uh, acres of parkland, and that doesn't include their golf courses. But the county allows the city to use a percentage of county and state parks, beaches, golf courses, and school property. So their conclusion in the paragraph below the chart, which sends shivers down my spine, is they have a surplus of parkland, 201 acre surplus of parkland. Because first of all, their level of service is only three acres per thousand population, which is fairly so, so slow, fairly low to start with. And I don't know what, where that came from. And then on top of that, they allow the municipalities to credit um, county and state parks, beaches, golf courses, et cetera, towards that. So when we did the chart on the bottom, which did the level of service just based on city property, uh, with and without golf courses, we came out with a metric that says it could be as low as 1.5 acres per thousand population. When the old standard for parks and rec was 10 acres per thousand, and 1.5 acres is really considered by pretty much everyone as a very low level of service standard. So this chart just kind of shows the conundrum we have as planners about what should we count, what should we not count. And again, each community needs to decide which metrics are appropriate and what should they count and not count. And we can talk about that more in the, the, uh, in the Q&A process. We talked about that you are free as a public agency to come up with your own metrics. And so we're, when we're talking about resiliency and sustainability, in the book, I talk about these are some examples of how you can take the indicators that are used for sustainability, for example, or resiliency, and turn those indicators into metrics for level of service. So, you know, whether it's bicycle and pedestrian access or green infrastructure or health or social and educational programs or economic development, you can fashion your own metrics that you wish to follow and, and talk about the role of parks and open space. Um, in a reasonable way. It's not going to solve all the problems, but it, you can talk about how parks and open space can contribute to more sustainable, resilient, livable communities. So here's our last poll. Just curious, when's the last time that your department actually updated your level of service metrics in your comp plan? And after that poll, we'll wrap it up. There are your results. And they are? Within the past year, 40%. Um, two to five years ago, 20%. Six to 10 years ago, 30%. Not since I've been here, 10%. Interesting. Actually, a lot of folks have updated them in the last, ten, in the, uh, last year. That's interesting. I'd like to hear more about that as well. Okay. So we're, we're uh, wrapping this up. So this is um, the same as traditional process in that ultimately you take everything that you've done so far, the existing conditions analysis, the preliminary implementation framework, the needs assessment, level of service analysis. And at some point, you then need to develop a long range vision. We have a whole visioning workshop process that we use and come up with the implementation strategy. The difference between the traditional linear process and this process says that at this point in the process, nothing should be a surprise to your elected official. I'm sorry, elected officials. That the implementation strategy and the vision are really reflecting all the prior discussion. They're reflecting the hypothesis that you came up with in the preliminary implementation framework. They're reflecting the preliminary implementation strategies. So you are refining what you've come up with before, you're making adjustments to it, 
Um, and then you're going back around to present your findings again to the elected officials. But it should not be a surprise at this time. This is really a point in the process where you're pulling everything together to lead to presentations, adoption, approval, as opposed to any uh, major new uh, findings at the end of the process. So you're coming full circle. So um, the long range vision implementation strategy need to be compelling. So this is a time when graphics really, really need to be compelling. I've always liked, this is the, the plan graphic that we did for Washington, DC. This is a graphic on the right, just of the, the little city of Newport Ritchie, showing the idea of converting one of their roadways into um, an urban greenway. Um, so we have such great technology now. Uh, we have all kinds of ways to do graphics that are compelling, that try to explain to our elected officials as well as the general public what the vision is. Um, we also, because we start early with the implementation strategy, by the time we get to this phase of the project, hopefully we have one that's already been approved, or, or at least we have the sense that it'll be approved by everyone. Uh, for those who live in central, North Central Florida, when we did the uh, Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Affairs Master Plan for Gainesville, we started talking with the Office of Management and Budget from the very beginning. So by the time we were done with the plan, we were already preparing for the Wild Spaces in Public Places referendum, which is a $130 million sales tax. Um, and so similarly, most recently, um, we started the City of Port St. Lucie master plan. In the preliminary implementation framework, we started talking to them about $250 million of improvements, which was not acceptable to them. And so we had some great discussions early on. Um, ultimately, it ended up being a $50 million phase one which we thought was great success. So our master plan was approved and adopted with a $50 million phase one um, implementation strategy in the, in the uh, plan. So that brings you back full circle. Um, and, you know, after you do this, uh, the planning process typically takes a year or more. You start implementing and, you know, four or five years later, it's time to do it all over again. And uh, you've implemented your, your top priorities in phase one and the process starts all over again. So the big takeaways, to wrap this up, this is the last slide. And I think um, uh, Terry mentioned, if you have questions, please email those in. Um, so we are past the point, um, what I think of as a tipping point in the United States, where there's really any argument anymore about the role of parks and open spaces in resilient, sustainable, livable communities. I think pretty much, at least on a project by project basis, people accept that as being a fact. And I think where we need to make improvements is going to that next step. So we need to plan our parks and open space systems as part of the broader public realm. We talk about the integrated plexus. We need to broaden the perspectives. We talk about all these different dimensions of parks and open space planning that we need to think about at that planning and initiation phase of the process. And we need to keep those dimensions in mind as we go through the existing conditions analysis, as we go through the needs assessment, as we develop our long range vision, we have to keep those different dimensions at the forefront. So we make sure that we really are coming up with high performance spaces that will help advance our communities. And I showed on the left, the images of the historic Fourth Ward Park, which was really designed as a stormwater facility. Wonderful example, uh, in addition to what I showed for Kissimmee, as a high performance public space. I haven't talked much about the fourth bullet, but if you're interested um, in community leadership, what we have found is those who rise to leadership positions in the planning of the public realm uh, are able to elevate themselves and their agency as leaders in the community. The, the planning process um, that we're espousing for the public realm especially if we're talking about sustainability and resiliency, becomes so visible in the community and touches so many people. It's a wonderful opportunity to raise the profile of your department, your agency, uh, and some of your, your broader comp plan goals. So you can use the process in all kinds of ways to kind of uh, build awareness of what you're trying to achieve. And the last bullet is a real mouthful but it's kind of everything I've been talking about for the past hour. It says that the big takeaway here is that our planning process has got to be much more robust and rigorous and collaborative 
uh, borrowing from these different areas of, of uh, strategic planning, project management, and applied social science research if we wish to generate the kinds of benefits that we're talking about system-wide. So with that, thank you all very much for participating in what's been an hour of this webinar. And I'll turn it back over to Terry and Patty and see where you'd like to go from here. Yeah, thanks, Dave. This is Terry. Um, just an observation. I, um, I, I'm i just amazed and impressed with how far that you've taken this in the parks planning integration into the overall comprehensive planning process. And back when dinosaurs were roaming South Florida, I remember the first recreation plan element I did for a comprehensive plan. It was kind of like, well, well, let's see, what do we want? We want an acre and a half for a thousand people for a community park. And we'd run that by the elected. Nah, that's going to cost too much. Let's bump that down to a half an acre, you know, and just this really informal kind of political iterative process. And it seems like your process has taken a lot of that and put, um, not the pressure, but the involvement of the public in on the, the entire planning process. So it's just incredible how far this has moved and how far you've advanced this uh, process, this profession. So we do have a question. And let me ask, yeah, let me ask the question. Do you think the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic will impact parks and recreation systems planning? <laughs> you and I were talking about whether or not we were an essential service uh, yeah. before we started. Right. So. Um, I've been talking to several folks. So the answer is yes, um, and in a couple of different ways. I think if I don't know how many people who are listening are in parks and recreation departments and how many folks are planners. Um, first of all, it's it's um, projected that uh, a lot of parks and recreation agencies are going to take a real financial hit um, because of the decline of sales tax revenues. So we have just the day-to-day -day operations are going to be impacted. Uh, the construction of new facilities are going to be impacted. Operations and maintenance are going to be impacted. Um, in terms of the system planning, you know, the question is going to be maybe someone had a, a plan budgeted for this year. And um, uh, elected officials may say, you know, that's not just that essential this coming year, especially if they don't see it as essential to resiliency and sustainability and economic development, you know, if, if they don't buy into that yet. Um, so, but I fully expect um, that the reduction in revenues is going to have a real impact on um, park system planning, at least in the near future. Hopefully, folks who are focused more on long-term thinking um, will see it as part of the response to the virus, and uh, and may wish to invest in in parks and open space system planning as one of the responses to um, to the virus. But we'll see. Yeah, good thanks. question. Yeah, it is. Um, and I have a question for you. We, you and I, have talked about this quite a bit, but how your thinking has changed over the years regarding the uh, involvement of elected officials. Um, how much you recommend that elected officials be involved in this process, and when in the planning process, the planning cycle that you've outlined. Yeah, I think it's gone from. Being, you know, it's a good idea to talk to them early. To now, um, we won't do, we won't start the plan unless um, that's part of the scope. Um, you know, it's not optional anymore. So what I found is, um, I'm trying to remember the quote that uh, Carlos uses: "Bring me in early, and I'm your partner. Bring me in late, and I'm your judge." And he borrowed that from. Um, uh, one of our clients, uh, the parks director from uh, Washington, D.C., Jose Aguari. Uh, um, but anyway, the idea is early, early in the process, it's very safe for me to go talk to you about money. If you're an elected official, we can go chat. We can talk about what we're starting, you know, the process we're starting. We can talk about what we hope to get out of the process. Um, we can ask for their support. We can talk about where money is going to come from, whether they support uh, things like bond referendums or sales tax referendums. It's very safe to do that, especially in their office or on a conference call or one-on-one. -on -one. Um, 
if you wait to the end and you're doing that and it's not even a public workshop, it's time when you're asking them to vote on whether or not they're going to approve your plan and they've never had that conversation with you, it's it's really dangerous territory. You're um, Early, early in my career, I had an elected official say, if I had known this is what you're going to present, I would have never approved the beginning of this process to begin with. Um, and that was a real wake-up call for me, and that was probably 30 years ago. So <clears throat> it is just absolutely critical. Um, the success stories that I have now in my practice almost all come from um, developing relationships with the elected officials where there's trust, where we've seen them numerous times through the process. We've been able to talk about really difficult issues early on and resolve them. So by the time we get to um, uh, acceptance, adoption, approval, um, again, I, I use the word trust. There's trust there. I'm not surprising them with anything they haven't already seen. They've asked all the difficult questions one-on-one -on -one in private. Uh, we've been able to answer them to their satisfaction. Or if we haven't, at least, you know, we, we've talked about how we're going to answer the, the issue. Um, and so, the again, there's no surprises. We're not putting anybody on the spot at the time we're asking for approval. So that's a long-winded answer. But I think it takes a minimum of three to four times of face time with the elected officials. And the more, the better. So, again, sorry for the long-winded answer, but I think it's a critical uh, part of the process. Yeah, and with the Florida Sunshine mm -hmm. Law, um, you do this, you've done this one-on-one, -on -one, right? You, you yeah. meet each elected official one-on-one -on -one outside of the public forum. So um, you can get a little bit more genuine or honest feedback at that point, right? And we do it both through interviews during the needs assessment process and then briefings. So it's 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 gathering their input early on and then getting their feedback later. So it's it's both one on ones. Uh, there's sort of a rhythm to it. One on ones at the beginning, uh, workshops and meetings in the middle and then one on ones again towards the end. Right. Right. Yeah. I always found that really interesting the way you do that. Yeah. Um, here, here's another question I have. Uh, what's the first thing you would recommend a local government planner do to introduce the concepts, your concepts of recreation system planning? If a local government has never really been introduced to this concept, they haven't, they haven't done their uh, recreation planning this way and really aren't familiar with it, what's a good way for a local government planner to introduce this concept? So I've really been enjoying using the video I showed. Um, because it's not just the concept of planning, it's, it's the concept of the importance of parks and open space as critical infrastructure for your community. And part of the problems with parks and rec through the years is it's been regarded as a non-essential service. And one of the things that John Crompton set out to do, he wrote a, a book on repositioning parks and, and recreation planning, or parks and recreation. Um, but that video does such a wonderful job of repositioning the discussion of saying to an elected official, you know, this isn't just about fun and games. This is about economic development. This is about infrastructure. This is about social equity. And so what I've been doing as an introduction to elected officials I'm working with, because many of them have not been introduced to this process, um, is showing them the video. And then showing them how the process is going to work to accomplish some of the things that are in the video. And then asking them what's important to them. Um, showing them the list of dimensions and asking them what's most important that they get out of this process. You know, in, in addition to meeting recreation needs, Commissioner, what's important to you right now? Um, and economic development is going to be, has always been a big one. But it's even going to be more so coming out of the coronavirus, as an example. So talking about the relationship between parks and open space and economic development is a good example. But I think that's a great question, Terry. I, again, I'm, I think the video, the, the process, and talking about the benefits that they hope to achieve are great openers. Yeah, I just want to remind people, the participants, that uh, Patty put the link to that video under the chat section of 
off to the right of your uh, software there. So if you link on, if you click on the chat and you scroll up to the top, you'll see the YouTube link to um, to the video that Dave showed us. Um, here's another question for you, Dave. How do you recommend communities address the funding of recreation improvements um, throughout your process? Or how, how do you deal with the funding? That, that's usually one of the first questions or obstacles that come up is, sure, we'd love to do that, but it costs too much. So let's see how good I am at technology. I'm going to see if I can put my screen back up. And can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, we're good. All right, let me see if I can go backwards. If I can't do it. Yeah, it's moving. So that chart right there is a good example. Um, we will come up with a laundry list. We, we have a standard laundry list, and we have a funding worksheet that shows 20 or 30 funding sources um, that we can discuss. And so when we have the preliminary implementation framework, so we go all the way back to the beginning of the cycle, we take that workshop and we try to meet with the budget director or the finance director. We also interview the commissioners or council members. And we start talking about which funding techniques are palatable to them. So we have, for example, if you bring up um, grants, almost everyone says, yes, grants are great. And we say, do you have a grant writer? either under contract or do you have an in-house grant writer? Yes or no. And so we talk about the need for a grant writer, either contractually or in-house if they don't have one. We talk about their willingness to bond. And they may say, you know what, we're already at our bonding capacity. Or politically, I'm not in favor of bonds. I don't believe in borrowing money. Um, or we talk about their sales tax capacity. Do they believe in sales tax, local, local option sales tax? Or do they have sales tax capacity? And we work our way through the toolbox of funding mechanisms. We talk about partnerships. So we talk about private, public-private partnerships. And we work our way through the toolbox. And maybe there's a dozen typical toolbox kinds of techniques. And then we ask the Office of Management and Budget to start doing projections. And this is at the very beginning of the process. What do we think we can generate through impact fees over the next 10 years based on housing start projections? Um, does your impact fee ordinance need to be updated? So I mentioned Nassau County. Before we ever started the system plan, we had uh, the county, based on the preliminary implementation framework, had already um, initiated an impact fee study and had gotten the commission to approve a higher parks impact fee. So, you know, we were talking about implementation again at the very beginning. So the it goes back to everything I've talked about, identifying all the funding sources, having these early meetings with the finance folks, having the early meetings with the elected officials to find out what's palatable, what's not palatable. We have some clients who say, you know, to be honest, I don't think we can do much for the next five years. We're going to have to rely on the CIP and grants, and, and Port St. Lucie is one of them. Uh, we've got the MSTU coming up for renewal in another five years. We think there's money there. Um, and so we have to start really slow. And so at least we know that going in and we can start looking for creative ways uh, to start doing some of the funding. In a lot of our communities, because of deferred maintenance that came out of the last recession, um, a lot of communities are happy if we can find money just to update existing parks and existing elements of the public realm to make improvements that deal with livability and resiliency and sustainability. So a lot of them start with a fairly slow uh, init, uh, implementation um, plan and then take off. But then you get others like Gainesville who approved the $130 million. And so those projects are are, uh, are uh, all in, in, in the works. So yeah, hopefully, I, hopefully I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, you did. And and I guess it's also uh, related to the question of just because you don't you aren't able to fully fund uh, the full menu of, of recreation improvements doesn't mean you shouldn't do the planning process. Right. I mean, it seems like a lot of folks will say, well, since we can't afford it, why should we plan? 
you know, why are we doing this exercise? Yeah, it goes back to that, that readiness audit. <clears throat> so the readiness audit is interesting. When I did my research, funding wasn't necessarily one of the key factors that lead to successful adoption of implementation. Because part of the literature says that great ideas, great innovation actually attracts money. So it's important that you have somebody who's going to champion the innovation, that the, and we talked about that, that you have somebody who believes in the importance of this, but they don't necessarily have to have money in place because oftentimes a really compelling idea, such as the High Line, such as the historic Fourth Ward, um, um, and there's other examples of transformational public spaces across the country. Um, one of my great quotes from Kissimmee, I showed you those slides at the beginning, uh, at the groundbreaking ceremony for the Lakefront Park, which was around 2007, I want to say, the mayor said, people ask, why are we spending $35 million in the middle of a recession? He says, the answer is, we're in the middle of a recession. <laughs> and so the idea of Kissimmee was they believed that their waterfront could be such a transformational space that it would attract money and pump money into the economy in downtown Kissimmee. And it turns out they were right. So Kissimmee's example was exactly what um, the video talked about for New York, for the High Line, uh, uh, for the historic Fourth Ward. So you don't have to have the money at the beginning, but if you can come up with compelling visions and compelling ideas, uh, literature suggests that they will attract money to them. Great. Thanks. That, that, that sometimes is a huge issue to deal with. And it's integrated as part of the economic development plan. I mean, the, the recreation Correct. system would be a yeah, big... Very, very, very much. Yeah, you know, part of the economic development plan. Um, yeah. That's a, I think that's the last question we have. Uh, in closing, we'll, we'll wrap this up maybe a minute or two early. Do you have any closing comments you'd like to share with everybody before we wrap this up? My main closing comment is just I appreciate everybody spending time with us. This is obviously something that I'm really passionate about. Um, Terry, you were a wonderful moderator, and I thank you very much for, for doing such a great job. I appreciate all of Patty's help for setting this up. And uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to email me. I'd love to hear about other folks' success stories in particular or particular issues because um, I, I like to continue refining this approach uh, to reflect what's really happening in all of our practices. So thank you all again very much. Great. Thanks, Dave. It was great having you on. And I think our first webinar for the San Alaska section was a big success. Um, I'd also like to remind people that if you want a copy of Dave's presentation, it's available under the handout drop down menu on this. And also to remind people that on, uh, two weeks from today at 1 p.m., my wife and I will be doing a session on project management and how it's related to adventure motorcycling. <laughs> so that should be interesting. I look forward to that. Uh, thank you. And everybody, if you get the newsletter from our section, you have my contact information. If you have any other ideas for webinars that you think would be interesting for us to present, please let me know. And I also want to thank Patty for helping coordinate all of this and the Florida chapter for providing us with the go-to webinar software to make it happen. And I think with that, we'll wrap it up. So thank you again, Dave. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. All righty. Bye-bye.